Okay, great. Well, I think we'll get started. So welcome everyone today to our first talk in the series of uh, quantum computing and industry. Um, we're very lucky to have with us today uh, two uh, very experienced researchers, uh, Nick Bront from IBM and um, Fernando uh, Gonzalez uh, Dalba from Quantum Motion. Um, so we're going to kick off with uh, Nick's talk and then Fernando's talk, and then we'll have some time for some Q&A at the end. So if you could please add any questions uh, to the Q&A section on the Zoom function, that would be great, and we will deal with them uh, at the end of the, the talk. Um, so if we start with Nick, so welcome, Nick. Thank you very much for coming today. Um, Nick is, Thank you for uh, having me. Nick is a research staff member at the Experimental Quantum Computing Center uh, for Watson Research Center at IBM. Um, he's uh, got a focus on responsibility of building qubit device design, packaging, and cryo measurements towards scaling to really large numbers of qubits. And that is a really, really exciting challenge. So without further ado, uh, thank you, Nick, and welcome. Well, thank you very much for that nice uh, introduction, Peter. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here at your inaugural industry talk. Um, so my name is Nick Braun, and uh, I guess uh, I'm going to focus on kind of the experimental aspects of quantum computing, being an experimentalist like I am. So I'm going to talk to you today about the hardware and where we're going with the hardware and the kinds of progress and milestones that we uh, expect to see. So uh, whenever I think about a quantum bit, I like to go back and think about what, what is a classical bit? Well, a classical bit needs to take some sort of form. It's not just an abstract concept that you're thinking of and it exists mathematically. Well, it is in some way and those abstractions are useful, but when you get to the nitty gritty of building a classical computer, you need to encode that information, those zeros and ones in the abstract into something physical like the on and off of a light switch or uh, the whether a transistor will allow or not allow current to pass through it or uh, the polarity of tiny magnets in your hard disk drive. So um, each one of those kinds of encoding states encodes a logical zero and one. And those because those are nonlinear, those will latch to either the on or off state or the left or right polarity state. And so those, um, those are essentially a way of encoding binary information. Uh, we could take a, an, an analogous turn and look and see what happens if you want to encode uh, information into a, a, into a system that obeys quantum mechanics. Well, then you can take so certain physical systems and you could consider possibly the ground or excited state of an atom or the up and down spin of an electron or the oscillations in tiny superconducting circuits. And you could label those as uh, zero or one. Uh, but then because these systems obey quantum mechanics, they obey Schrodinger's equation. And Schrodinger's equation means if you have a uh, wave function that describes zero and a wave function that describes one, then any complex superposition of those two solutions is also a valid solution of Schrodinger's equation, which brings us to superposition which is where we can uh, encode not just the logical states zero and one, but any complex superposition of them. And we represent this by something called the block sphere, where we say that uh, the north pole is, is the logical zero state, the south pole is the logical one state, and then you can represent any normalized complex superposition by a point on that sphere. So in particular, say any point on the equator is going to have an equal amplitude of zero and one. And when you measure these systems, they're going to, uh, uh, the probability of measuring those is going to be reflected by uh, where you are on that block sphere and that probability amplitude. So it's essentially this idea and the idea that you can entangle qubits together with one another that gives you this exponentially large space in which you can do computing. And that's where the promise of quantum computing lies. So what are the systems that we use? Uh, well, we're using superconducting qubits at IBM. And this is uh, well, one of the reasons we, we like this is because it relies on all the past skills that we have as uh, building classical computers, such as uh, photolithography, uh, etching processes, et cetera. So what we're starting with here is a piece of silicon. It's, we've got a five qubit device. And what you're looking at essentially is a, is a superconducting metal uh, that sits on top of that silicon. The silicon's not really doing anything for us in, uh, in, in the superconducting circuit other than being a substrate or a dielectric on which the superconducting sits. So these parts you see here, here are etched patterns in, in niobium. And if we look close, closely, uh, we can see the qubits exist in these little square pockets. And these qubits look like, uh, they look like this 90 degree rotated equal sign. And that's because these uh, large parts of the, uh, the equal sign represent the capacitor of the circuit. 
And if you look very, very closely, you'll see uh, some very special, uh, a very special superconducting element called a Josephine junction, which is a uh, insulator sandwiched into two superconductors. And, and what this forms electrically for us is a nonlinear inductor. In fact, it's dissipationless nonlinear inductor, which means uh, we don't have any loss as we operate these. And because it's an inductor, it forms an oscillator with those capacitor pads. So uh, I should note that um, all of these are made out of superconductors. There's niobium, uh, which becomes a superconductor below nine Kelvin, that's nine degrees Celsius above absolute zero, and aluminum, which becomes a superconductor above uh, about one, one Kelvin above one Kelvin. Um, this, uh, this Josephine junction here is about 100 by 100 nanometers squared. So it's like a very tiny part, and it's the only part that's made out of aluminum. The rest of it is, is niobium. Uh, these squiggles you see between here, these are essentially just hammered flat uh, coax, essentially. It's, it's patterned, actually, but it's essentially the coax you have at home that brings you uh, cable TV, but it's uh, on, on, on a substrate. So it's a signal essentially surrounded by ground planes. And these are used to connect the qubits together. They're used to uh, uh, filter qubits at the readout frequency because they're detuned from the qubit frequencies, and they're also used to uh, interact with the outside environment and perform measurements on the qubits. So they're similar and related to each other, but they have a, a very big difference. So if we just consider the microwave resonators, this is what we call linear LC oscillator. Um, and that's, that's because the modes of this system are equally spaced. Um, so this is just kind of like any LC oscillator you might have studied in your circuits class. And what that gives you is an energy level diagram where you have equal level spacings between each one of your energies. So if you want to label the lowest energy zero and the next lowest energy one, uh, the problem is if you try to excite and do, whoops, try to do quantum um, uh, operations between the two, you would leak into the higher order states because you can't distinguish them from energy. However, with the, uh, our, the, our superconducting qubit, which is specifically called the transmon uh, type of superconducting qubit, we have, uh, we have different level energy spacings between the zero and the one. And we get that because the Josephine junction is a nonlinear inductor. So we can singly address the zero and the one and pretend like the transmon was a qubit and by just, uh, by just staying in this zero one computational uh, basis. Uh, so I should also say here, there's a couple things is this energy level right here is, um, is variable due to the fact that this oxide, aluminum oxide here, is, it's glassy, it's grown, and even under the same growth condition, it's going to be uh, variable for each one of these junctions. So this energy level actually turns out to be a, a bit different for each one of those uh, junctions. And the other thing is that we use fixed frequency transmonds. So that's something that is a little bit more difficult to change after you fabricate it. So uh, these typically will come out to an energy around about five gigahertz uh, if you uh, multiply that by h bar. Um, and that energy of five gigahertz corresponds to when you might multiply it by h bar and uh, uh, divide it by Boltzmann's constant, that's about a 240 millikelvin, which means uh, this is the reason why we have to operate these uh, superconducting qubits at such a cold temperature, way colder than the critical temperatures of one and nine Kelvin, but, but much, much less than 240 millikelvin, which brings us to our next slide, which is just kind of an overview of how we do a um, uh, measurements or, or control. Uh, so from a computer, we can send out measurements or control signals uh, from that computer to microwave generators uh, that, that mix uh, waveforms with RF synthesizers to generate, say, sine waves or shape pulses. This one's square. This is a measurement pulse, nice and boring. Uh, it goes into this fridge, which keeps the, uh, keeps the qubits very, very cold, and the uh, signals go and interact with the readout resonators, uh, a different kind of, uh, sim similar to those kinds of resonators I showed before. Uh, the, 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 uh, it collapses the state of the qubit onto the phase of that, and then it's amplified, brought back out, uh, mixed back down, and classified as a zero or one. So that's just kind of a really quick demonstration of what um, one of these experiments looks like. Um, so, sorry. This always happens when I... Okay. So uh, what, are, what are the kinds of things we talk about, well, um, when designing these, uh, when designing and measuring these uh, superconducting qubits? Well, there's a lot of... Uh, you know, a lot of engineering you can do with superconducting qubits. So uh, for example, one of the things we do is control things at these frequency. Now, these frequencies, they come out around five gigahertz and that, that is fine uh, as long as it's kind of in the ballpark, but the relationship between the different frequencies of the qubits that are connected is very important to us because it affects the performance of our two qubit operations, the way we can entangle these qubits to generate these large, uh, ex this exponentially large com computational space. Um, these qubits are also very fragile, so they're, they're, they have a lifetime. Even if they were completely perfect, they would, they would have a lifetime that would be limited by the decoherence. So it's essentially like I put the qubit in a zero or one, or I put it in a superposition of zero and one, and how I want to ask how long does that quantum information stay quantum? And that's affected by the decoherence time. The measurement is also defined by that, uh, 
by that picture I just showed you about how how much can we take a very very small signal at the bottom of a you know 10 millikelvin fridge and amplify that and extract that back out at room temperature and classify whether I measured that as a zero or a one. And then we have uh, our, our gate operation. So we want to do things as fast as possible and normally because we have this decoherence that's always happening to our system. But our gate speeds are limited by the fact that our qubits are not qubits and we have these higher order uh, levels. So you can look at the anharmonicity, which is essentially what we call the frequency difference between the zero one and the one and two. The two state is also sometimes called the F state. Um, so the, the, uh, the frequency difference between those two is the anharmonicity and those are going to limit how fast you can do operations because you don't want to actually accidentally leak into those higher energy levels. Uh, and they're also going to be limited by the interaction rates, how, how much are your two qubits coupled to each other. That's going to influence how fast you can do operations between them. Uh, so that's kind of the physical mechanisms behind all of this. And so I'll go into how we, uh, how we uh, we overall classify these as something, a term you might've heard of called quantum volume. So a lot of people talk about how many qubits they have, which more is better, you know, that's wonderful. Um, but really there's a lot more things that go into uh, how good a quantum processor is than, than just the number of qubits. It matters how much, how well are they connected uh, and how many operations can you do. So the easier you can do operations between those qubits, essentially the easier to, uh, the, the more powerful your system is. And then the errors are probably the biggest thing because there are a lot of errors. Each one of these operations has errors on it on top of the uh, always, you know, uh, your, your qubits are always decohering. So uh, errors are kind of the bane of our existence and that's what we spend a lot of our time studying. So this metric kind of uh, encapsulates all of these. And just to give you kind of a, a summary of what it is, it's, it's been um, defined in a mathematically rigorous way. Um, but just to give you a flavor of what it means, it's essentially how large of an arbitrary square circuit can you reasonably execute. And by square circuit, I mean a circuit that has the same number of qubits, uh, which are, are showed on the vertical here. And uh, yeah, on the vertical here, and how many uh, how how many depth of circuits do you have, which is shown on the horizontal in D. And and we you generally view quantum circuits as 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 um, being a wire for each qubit, and and uh, moving from left to right, you play each system, uh, you play each uh, gate operation that happens to it. So what this represents essentially is just permutations given by these pi's. Uh, between the qubits and arbitrary uh, operations between pairs of qubits. So essentially what this is is effective uh, arbitrary uh, circuits that are done between any qubits um, in, in your system. And because you have to map this to an actual physical device, it's going to be really influenced on, on the connectivity and the architecture of, uh, of uh, what you actually have. Okay, so for example, it's not just the hardware that counts, but it's how well do you map those, uh, those circuits to, um, uh, to the device that you have at hand. So this, for example, is IBM Q Tenerife, which was the first uh, five qubit or first quantum computer put on the cloud. It consisted of five qubits and it had this, uh, this layout where you, the arrows mean that you actually have the physical microwave resonators that are connecting the qubits, which means you can do operations between those. So for example, you can do an operation between two Q0 and Q0, Q, Q2 and Q0, but not between Q4 and Q0. There's nothing um, connecting those two. So if you have a bernstein vazirani type circuit here and you look at the circuit, well, you can see that uh, Q4 actually has all of the, uh, has C naughts with all the other uh, qubits, which means you're gonna wanna do two qubit interactions uh, with, uh, with Q4 that has, uh, that's the, the, all the, the unified one. Um, so if you had a good mapper, it would recognize that and it would relabel Q4 to Q2 because Q2 is connected to all the other four circuits. So you could easily do two qubit interactions. Um, so you could get a much smaller circuit in depth um, uh, using a good mapper. However, if you look at a bad mapper and you just um, blindly label, label Q, um, you know, the qubits in your algorithm to the qubits on the device, then you're going to have to do a lot more circuits because you're gonna to have to swap quantum information around due to the fact that there's not limited connectivity in your system. And if you run that on the device, you're gonna see that the good mapper actually gives you the result you want and the bad mapper gives you a result where the answer is indistinguishable from noise. So this compiling is, is very, uh, and a very important part of uh, quantum volume as well. And uh, just to, I'm gonna kind of talk to you about a recent result we had, I'd try and keep you, uh, keep it fresh. So. Uh, most, our most recent result was uh, quantum volume 64. So quantum volume 32 was gotten earlier in January of this year. Uh, and that's when people started making analogies with Moore's law because uh, Gordon Moore, Moore, the famous CEO of Intel, got these four data points when he was talking about the uh, density of computation that can be done with classical computers. And after these four, he said it's exponential. And that's uh, kind of the world we've been living in until recently. Well, we, we saw that and we're like, oh, we're going to have an exponential increase of quantum volume. But it turns out we actually achieved quantum volume 64 ahead of this kind of schedule, which we're, we're pretty uh, happy about. 
Um, so in order to talk about, um, you know, this kind of compilation and, and software and everything, I'm just going to introduce our, our software stack. So we have a open source quantum uh, framework for quantum computing called Qiskit. Uh, originally stood for the Quantum Information Science Toolkit. And essentially it's a, it's a, it's a uh, Py, essentially an open source yeah, Apache 2.0 framework written in Python. It's modular and extensible. Uh, it's written for any kind of quantum and any kind of gate-based quantum hardware, not just uh, our superconducting qubits, but it'll work on other kinds of hardware. And it sits on top of the hardware we have. So there's kind of an interaction between this software and hardware, which takes place in this element Terra, which is kind of the foundation to build, uh, run, and compile circuits uh, on any kind of quantum hardware. Um, but then on top of that, we, we build uh, kind of useful things such as tools for characterizing mitigation error. Errors are going to be with us for a long time. Fault tolerance is very, very far, uh, far, far off. So uh, right now, if we want to have any success with quantum computing, we have to deal with uh, error and how we can uh, study it and, and get rid of it and or, or just run algorithms that don't care about it. Um, we also have simulators, so we can also understand the kind of error which helps when, in development of um, our systems. Also, every kind of quantum hardware has its own different kind of error. Uh, and then for uh, use cases, we have kind of Aqua, which is our framework of libraries for um, domain experts so they can start using quantum computers efficiently without having to know all the nuts and bolts uh, that's down here. And, and so, for example, we have applications for artificial intelligence, finance, chemistry, and optimization. Uh, we have open source communities, so this is on, um, you can use pa uh, Python package installer uh, to just uh, and put it on your computer. It's on GitHub. We have a Slack community. We have uh, lots of community. Uh, we, we try and make it as open source as possible. And I'm just going to take a quick aside because this is kind of the area I work in uh, where we're starting to give pulse level access to uh, uh, well, we give it to everyone and, and especially to, to researchers in the field because this is still an active area of um, of, of research. So if you take uh, the simple quantum circuit on the left right here, what uh, you can do is perform a Hadamard that will take this Q0, which starts in a zero. You would put in a supervision of zero plus one. You do a C, C naught on it, you get the spell state zero, zero plus one, one. And so this is kind of a simple demonstration of entanglement. Uh, and it's kind of the, the simplest fun circuit that you can kind of make. Uh, the thing is, is when you actually compile this to microwave pulses to actual hardware, you're going to get this pulse schedule uh, we see here on the right. And so we have a few things going on here. So most of this action is happening on the drive channel, which is the on-resonant qubit control channel. I told you these uh, qubits have a frequency. So this drive channel uh, puts out pulses at that frequency of the, that qubit. Uh, so we have two qubits, D0 and D1. We also have a control channel, which is given by the U, and that's going to be off-resonant control. And we use this for our two qubit gates, so something we call cross-resonance. So it's actually this U1 channel is going to be a pulse at the frequency of Q0. Um, and then following these operations are going to be measurement pulses given by M0 and M1 in the red here. And there's going to be acquire pulses given by A0 and A1, which essentially tell digitizer to turn on and to start acquiring the data so you can measure the phase shift and see whether you uh, measured the qubit as zero or one. So there's a lot going on here and we, we've been publishing and detailing the kinds of things that we're doing. Um, so for example, if we want to do a Z rotation around the block sphere, it turns out we can do that in software by compiling uh, all the subsequent pulses and we don't actually need to do those. And the, the only perfect operation, the only perfect quantum operation you're ever going to do is the one you don't do at all. So the way we make this more efficient is to implement frame changes instead of Z rotations. We also use this technique called derivative removal of adiabatic gates to shape our pulses slightly um, by adding the derivative of the Gaussian on the quadrature component. Uh, that reduces some errors. We do some dyna dynamical decoupling, so this cross-resonance term doesn't give us just the interaction we want, but a lot of other interactions come along for the ride, and this echo sequence helps us get rid of uh, those prominent ones. And then we have some other rotary echo sequences to help get rid of spectator errors and crosstalk. So there's a lot going on in, in even just a simple circuit, and it's very uh, interesting. And I, I bring this up to show you the kind of control improvements we use for quantum volume 64. They were all done in software. There was no hardware improvements. It's the same hardware that we did quantum volume 32 on. So one of the first ones was the improved Qiskit compiler. So if you want to take a arbitrary, uh, uh, arbitrary uh, interaction between two qubits, you can always decompose those into single qubits on each one of these wires and then uh, three C knots, which are given by these uh, things over here. Now, normally you want to try and uh, make this as simple as possible, but because we're running so many circuits back to back, we realize that we can actually try and pull these single qubits out of the um, uh, out of the circuit, which which normally would make that single circuit longer, but then we can combine that with other circuits so we can eliminate uh, more circuits on the back end. So essentially these on the back and the, sorry, on the on the back and the front would be meeting the circuit, uh, the next one of these, and then we could start eliminating single qubit gates. So we can actually use that to get, uh, um, let's see, I think it was like 9.3, 
circuits on our 9.3 singles on average to 7.4. So you can shave off some, uh, some number of single qubit circuits. Uh, we also have dynamical decoupling. So the, the kind of dumbbells you see here are the C knots. That's where most of the error is happening. That's where the two qubits are interacting. Um, but a lot of the times there's, a, there's an idle time on the qubits where nothing's happening. So by putting these little, um, these little single qubit gates here, we're essentially keeping them occupied. We're essentially refocusing the error. And by doing that, we can, we can reduce the errors as well. We're also starting to use the excited, uh, the excited, the second excited state of the qubit to do readouts so we can promote uh, the one state to the, uh, uh, to the two or F state before we measure. And that gives us uh, enhanced contrast when we do the measurement. On top of that, it, it will also uh, mitigate uh, relaxation during the measurement. Uh, and then we started um, playing with our two qubit interactions. So instead of that pulse sequence I showed you before where we have the echoes and everything, which called the echo cross resonance C naught, we can do a direct C naught, which is a little bit harder to tune up, but it allows us to, um, allows us to do active cancellation to get rid of those terms instead of, uh, instead of echoes. And uh, by doing that, we can shave maybe say like 80 nanoseconds off a 280 nanosecond pulse. But in this game, like kind of every, every nanosecond, every gate, you can you can shave off is, is kind of a win. And by doing all these four uh, together, none of them individually, you need all four of these, we could achieve a quantum volume of 64. Uh, so let me just uh, take these last few minutes to kind of give us our roadmap to uh, where we are right now and uh, where we see ourselves going to um, large quantum systems that are error corrected with millions of qubits in them. Uh, so that's not daunting at all. So let's see what, we're, what we have. So we've kind of laid out a roadmap at least for the next uh, few years. Um, with the kinds of device levels we're going to be targeting uh, that are in, that have been released and are in development in order to achieve this. So, uh, so let's see. 2019 is when we released the the Falcon type of device, which is 27 qubits, uh, and we just recently released the 65 qubits we call a hummingbird. Um, that's the device name, and each one of these these devices, when they're deployed, they get the name of a they get the name of a city. Uh, so this Falcon device, there's a few technical changes we've made. Um, going up to this scale. So uh, for example, uh, this is the device that released quantum volume 64. And uh, one of the things is we had a lot of problems with spectator errors. So what we did is actually reduce the connectivity. I told you enhanced connectivity was better, but we're actually find that due to the errors that that enhanced connectivity was causing, it was actually easier to go to a lattice with less connectivity. And this is something we call the heavy hex hexagonal lattice. And it's important to us because it's um, also a lattice that will support a quantum error correction code. So we can go forward with this and, uh, and build a fault tolerant com quantum computer out of this reduced uh, connectivity lattice. So that, that allows us to get um, higher quantum volume with that. And uh, additionally, we, we started doing a, um, a laser annealing technique so that we could change the frequencies of the qubits uh, post fabrication, essentially by blasting them with a laser, um, which actually helps us control that spread of frequencies so we can do two qubit operations uh, in a more optimized way. Uh, the more recent one, the 65 qubit one we released a couple months ago, this uh, is a similar kind of lattice. It's, um, you know, kind of two of the previous ones um, put together. Um, but we've, been, we've put some more uh, architectural uh, advantages in it, such as readout multiplexing, where we can take eight readout signals and combine them through the same amplifier and, and do frequency multiplexing on them. Uh, and then when we have those frequency multiplex signals, we can essentially integrate and discriminate on, on um, on hardware, essentially, you know, uh, programmable FPGAs, which really reduces the latency by um, figuring out the measurements in, in hardware rather than software. So this is a, you know, very recent improvement we've had. Um, what we're looking to in the future is a 127 qubit Eagle. It's going to be similar, but some of the fabrication uh, challenges are going to be addressed. So what we really want to do is um, uh, use uh, three silicon vias, which is essentially connecting the top of a si silicon wafer to the bottom of a silicon wafer. And, uh, you know, that's typically done in CMOS, but we need these things to be super conducting and super clean and all these kinds of things. So that makes things a bit harder. That's going to give us uh, a spurious mode mitigation. We can, we can essentially build Faraday cages around our qubits so they don't get affected by uh, what other qubits are doing next to them. Uh, we also want to do multi-level wiring, so much, much more akin to what CMOS does, but a lot harder when you need the quality of... Uh, uh, the quality of materials that that quantum computing demands and then we also want to have real-time classical compute which is essentially fpga controlled logic that operates within the coherence time of a um on uh, the coherence time of the qubits so that you can do say fast uh, fast feedback or fast feed forward operations 
Uh, then we got 433, you know, going up the ladder. So technical highlights we need to have here is we really need to increase the density of what's going on in the fridge. So I told you these were like, micro, you know, these microwave cables are, they're similar to your cable TV you have at home and they're, they're a little smaller, um, you know, quite a bit smaller, but they still take up a lot of space when you go to hundreds of them. So we really need to come up with a more monolithic solution such as cryofix cables. Uh, we need to get signals in and out uh, better, for example. And then as we go to 1,000, which is what we're planning for 2023, um, we've got to continue to push these two qubit error rates down. Uh, we've been able to do that as we build these bigger devices, but that's one of the kind of hard, really, really hard things to do. Um, and in addition to that, we need a super fridge, which uh, I'll show in the next slide, I think. Um, so we got this huge lattice and we're going to start uh, building essentially our own cryogenics and uh, try and just go to town. Um, we're also, uh, yeah, here we go. So we've got a essentially, a, a, a uh, dilution refrigerator that you can like live inside is how big it is, but uh, you need this to cool all the components for a thousand to a million qubits. Um, we'll see how it goes. We need to start integrating some of those uh, control electronics inside of the fridge, such as uh, using cryo CMOS, uh, semiconductors that won't freeze out when they're very cold and that don't dissipate much power so you can keep everything else cold. Uh, and, and as well as uh, integrating all of the kind of readout um, uh, readout processors with the amplifiers and microwave uh, isolators and circulators and, and all the kind of routing you need uh, integrate that together. And so um, that's kind of the outlook we have right now. And uh, with that, I thank you very much for your time. And I'll, I guess I'll be answering questions later. Great. Well, fantastic. Thank you very much, Nick. That was a really uh, interesting talk. Um, I like the idea of a, a dilution fridge that you can live in. That sounds uh, sounds quite special. Brilliant. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. Great. Well, if I could invite uh, Fernando to, to switch his camera on now and join us uh, for the second talk. So Fernando is the lead quantum engineer uh, at Quantum Motion. Quantum Motion is a spin out from, from UCL with a, a focus on, um, on silicon qubits. Um, so really looking for, forward to your talk, Fernando. I, I, I have some notes down here to give you a good introduction, but you've got far too many awards for me to read out in the time we've got left. The, the most fantastic one, I think, is probably Young Scientist by, by the Spanish Royal Society of Physics in 2017. But really looking forward to your talk, and thank you for coming today, Fernando. Well, thank you very much, Peter, for having me and for the very nice introduction. And, uh, and uh, thanks to Nick, I would really like to congratulate you for the, uh, the excellent progress that you are having at uh, IBM. Uh, it, it's really inspiring. So um, today, uh, with my presentation, what I wanted to do is if you, uh, introduce you to the proposition that quantum motion has for uh, quantum computing. So over the last couple of years, uh, we've seen tremendous progress in the field of silicon-based quantum computing with demonstrations of one and two qubit gates approaching fault tolerant thresholds. But uh, in quantum motion, what we believe is that now is the time to take those demonstrations to a new phase of development in which quantum design fully exploits the industrial capabilities of the semiconductor industry. What we aim to do is to trigger a transition from lab-based demonstrations to silicon-based quantum processors manufactured at scale. Um, but let's first set the scene uh, for this proposition. Um, so last so year, you're, um, yeah. you're not sharing your slides at the moment. No? You're not seeing my slides? Not yet. I uh, know. Uh, let's uh, uh, try again. Yeah, we can see PowerPoint now, and now we see your. Yeah, perfect. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Uh, otherwise, I would have keep on going. Uh, yeah, so what I wanted to say is that the, uh, last year we saw a world changing achievement from researchers at Google, and we are seeing uh, day after day tremendous advances from our colleagues at IBM that tell us that uh, quantum computers are starting to take off. We have just entered a new era that, of the noisy intermediate scale quantum computing in which uh, quantum advantage has been demonstrated. This is a remarkable achievement and represents a very important milestone in quantum computing research, but brings focus towards the ultimate goal of uh, all the researchers in this field, which is that of the uh, excuse me, uh, fault-tolerant uh, quantum computing era. 
a universal quantum machine with sufficient error-free computing resources to run algorithms with the potential to transform society. So in the order of 100 qubits, where we are sitting now at the moment, we have uh, NIST machines that can perform combinatorial optimization problems, compression of quantum data, quantum calculations with variational quantum algorithm solvers, quantum approximate uh, optimization algorithms. But in the, in the fault tolerant era is where we expect to see the exponential speed up of quantum computers with general optimization problems, source algorithm for online security, uh, throttle type algorithms for molecular simulations and HHL type of algorithms. So our proposition to get there is that of a MOSFET. We believe that the MOSFET, the workhorse of the microelectronics industry, the building block of all major electronic information processing components, such as the microprocessor, memory chips, and telecommunication microcircuits, will get us to that level of integration. Because it has already been done by going from simple circuits with one or two transistors to the billions of transistors that exist in microprocessors or even in memory devices that contain more transistors than stars in the Milky Way in the size of your hand. Furthermore, electron spins in isotopically enriched silicon are one of the most coherent solid state systems in nature with uh, coherence on the excess of 20 milliseconds. So, in fact, if we look at the specifications of the demonstrations of silicon-based quantum processors that are out there, things are looking quite good for the field, with demonstrations of key steps approaching fault tolerant thresholds, and with competitive values with respect to superconducting qubits, indicating that attempting to build a fault tolerant quantum computer based on silicon technology is a very realistic proposition, in my view. However, there are many technological challenges that are ahead, and we need to translate these very impressive results from academic grounds to large-scale manufacturing. So a possible strategy is to export the qubit devices that have been demonstrated in these uh, academic groups um, into a large-scale uh, silicon fabrication facility. The problem with this approach is that it's likely to require significant process integration uh, of development at the CMOS foundry. So what we present here is an alternative route where an existing process flow for the fabrication of CMOS transistors is taken as a starting point and is adapted to obtain devices with qubit functionality. So we take the transistor as a starting point, and here I would like to mention our collaborators at Leti uh, in Grenoble, who are the man current manufacturers of these devices. And we just make a small modification to this um, very traditional transistor structure, where you see here, uh, one second, the source, the drain of a transistor, and the gate that allows you to switch on and off that transistor. We just make a small modification in which we split that gate into two sections. And we are going to call those two gates one, the qubit gate, and the other one, the sensor gate. This is where we are going to implement our electron spin qubit, and this is gate is going to be used uh, for sensing that electron spin qubit. If we take a, a cut along the direction of those gates and uh, present a cartoon of how the transistor looks like in the inside, what happens is that at the topmost corners of the silicon nanowire transistor, electrons, single electrons can be accumulated and we use the spins of those single electrons as our basic qubit structure. Furthermore, uh, we like this approach because it can be scaled to larger processors, not only single qubit structure, but uh, larger in the one dimension, such as processors with 4, 8, and 16 qubits that are being manufactured currently. But also quantum motion uh, works at the architectural level, uh, thinking of algorithms that could be run in these machines in such a way that it will give us advantages already in the NISC era, but also thinking of how to integrate these different structures into a fault tolerant architecture. But not only that, we take inspiration from algorithmic considerations to influence the design of these silicon structures to better manufacture those devices. 
So I would just like to highlight a, a set of uh, results that the group has been getting over the last couple of years. And as I said, uh, we may mainly focus on quantum hardware and recently have demonstrated the, a compact way of reading out spin uh, with long relaxation times on a CMOS device uh, for the first time. And then we also demonstrated a combination of um, a readout of spins with uh, Josephson parametric amplification and demonstration of remote sensing in two dimensional quantum dot arrays. We also work at the quantum classical interface with a demonstration that I will hope to show on time division multiplexing to be able to read large arrays of quantum devices with a reduced number of resources, trying to think of how to scale up to the many qubits. But also, as I said, we also think of uh, architectures and we have some ideas for a new concept on pipelining that can be used uh, for the NISC era, but also the concept of multi-core NISC that I hope to um, be able to introduce at the end of the presentation in which small quantum processors can be run in parallel to accelerate uh, algorithms, hybrid classical quantum algorithms such as uh, variational quantum Michael solvers that are very much amenable to parallelization. And we also uh, are thinking of how to structure these uh, devices into fault tolerant architectures. So let me concentrate first on some hardware demonstration that we produced very recently. And it focuses on the readout program of silicon devices. Here you see a typical silicon device. This one is from uh, the University of New South Wales, uh, demonstration from uh, Menno Belhos in 2014, where you see some uh, gates on the surface of a silicon device that are used to isolate individual electrons at the silicon-silicon oxide interface. So these are for uh, a quantum dot uh, uh, so electron isolation. And then there is an electrode on the surface for manipulation of those pins. And then there is this remaining element that is used for readout. This is an electrometer. It's a very sensitive single electron transistor. So typically what one will do to read out spins is apply an external magnetic field and try to load an electron into your quantum dot. It can either load in a spin down configuration or a spin up configuration. And typically what one will do is try to shift those energy levels such as only the spin up, sorry, the spin down configuration can exit the quantum dot under certain conditions. That produces a charge motion, electron comes out and uh, comes back in into the quantum dot which is different from a situation in which you had a spin up in which the electron remains in the quantum dot during the whole process. And then you unload and then you repeat the process. So with a single electron device, what you will see is that the current that you measure in the readout phase is different depending on whether you had a spin up state or a spin down state to start with. So that's the current way of doing single electron sensing. But this structure is a, quite a complex structure that uh, takes up at least a quarter of the uh, uh, footprint or the space available on chip for uh, the, um, the quantum processor. So we are coming up with ideas to simplify that architecture to make it as simple as possible and free out space in the quantum chip using a single electron box measured by gate reflectometry as a more compact option. So here we have our um, uh, uh, our qubit device where we have the one gate and then we connect the other gate to uh, some low temperature electronics that uh, consist of an electrical resonator that is uh, constituted by a capacitor and a superconducting inductor and what we do is embed the device into that uh, resonator and monitor the resonant frequency which appears as an absorption uh, in the frequency spectrum of the resonator monitor the resonant frequency uh, as a function of uh, gate voltage parameters of that device. So here you see an example of a measurement in which we measure that frequency of resonance as a function of the voltages that we apply on the sensor gate and the qubit gate. So first of all, you see signal here that comes from the sensor that is going to be our uh, sensing signal that is broken in the top uh, part of the picture because uh, electrons are being loaded under the qubit gate. So if we zoom in into this uh, region, which is the region of interest, what we find is that our sensor tells us whether the, um, uh, depending on the signal of our sensor, the location of the engaged space of the signal of our sensor, it tells us whether the, elect the uh, qubit uh, gate is hosting no electrons or one electron. So we can use this regime 
to do spin readout of the qubit spin by uh, producing a, sing, a sequence of pulses that I'm going to explain in the following. So basically, uh, in the empty phase, we unload the qubit dot. And then in the load phase, we load the, elect, uh, the dot with a random spin that can be in spin up or spin down configuration. And then we move on to the readout phase in VR position and monitor whether the spin was in spin up or a spin down state. And here you see uh, the signature of a spin up signal that shows a spike in the readout phase, whereas whether the spin was in a down configuration, that signal doesn't show any spike whatsoever. So we can distinguish between spin up and spin down states. So uh, we can measure the relaxation time uh, by repeating uh, these measurements as a function of the wait time in the load phase and as a function of magnetic field. And we found relaxation times of the order of nine seconds, which is on a par with state of the art results. So what we are finding is that CMOS devices that can be manufactured at scale can produce the, um, the same state of the art results that have been produced in, in, the, in academic environments. And this is very good news for the field because the fact of moving all the technology into an industrial setting is not trivial in order to maintain the uh, properties of the spin states on those structures. So um, I think I'm running out of time if I'm not mistaken. So uh, probably I will need to uh, fast forward. Uh, unless uh, I have a couple more minutes to continue. But, uh, uh, please continue, Fernando, please. Yeah, that's all right. Okay, very good. Um, so then I wanted to show another um, interesting result uh, from some of the members of our team uh, that uh, is related to the idea of scaling up, uh, moving from one or two qubit quantum processors that have been demonstrated in the literature by the different groups of UNSW, DELT, or CIA, Leti. To, uh, um, to the many uh, uh, qubit processors. For example, here you have a, a multi-qubit structure fabricated at Princeton by a PETAS group. Uh, the problem as we scale up uh, silicon devices is that we start with a quantum layer or a quantum device. And then typically we have all the control uh, coming from room temperature with individual wires that at least one of them is necessary to control a qubit. So at the moment, the paradigm is one qubit one line coming from room temperature. But silicon offers uh, very exciting opportunities to tackle this problem, which is to have a digital interface in between the room temperature and, uh, and the low temperature that will reduce the number of lines that have to go all the way from room temperature to the millikelvin temperatures that are necessary for our experiments. And unavoidably, as we go to the thousands or millions of qubits, will be an unsustainable approach. So by using a CMOS digital layer, we can overcome this issue and try to reduce the number of lines that are necessary for each qubit. So a proposal um, to do so came from the group at the University of New South Wales that indicated that interfacing quantum devices, silicon quantum devices with CMOS electronics will be the way to go in a similar fashion that is used to control, for example, dynamic random access memory devices in uh, classical electronics. So we went on to uh, present that uh, experimental demonstration with our silicon devices that can host single electrons. You see here one of those devices with a slightly uh, simplified structure. This is just a transistor, another one here. And now they are interfaced with uh, digital electronics, which are silicon devices that have been manufactured on the same wafer on the same substrate using exactly the same fabrication processes. So all this is monolithically fabricated in the same wafer. And then we read it with our electrical resonator. So something that is important is to have the resonant frequencies uh, uh, exactly the same when we switch on one of the cells to read one of the qubits and when we switch on the other cell to read the other the one quantum qubit, uh, the, other, the other qubit. So again, these devices come from our excellent collaborators at uh, Leti in Grenoble and have been fabricated in 300 millimeter CMOS wafers. So uh, what we can do is a dynamical study, uh, operate this dynamically and look at uh, the electronic oscillations of one of the devices when we turn on one of the transistors and the other one is switched off. And then we look at the other cell in this 
next part of the sequence. And we can repeat this protocol over a number of times and acquire maps of the two devices in an interlinked manner. So what we are doing now is to scale to more complex prototypes in which we will be able to measure much larger uh, arrays of quantum devices in two dimensions, not only using time multiplexing or time division multiplexing in the row, but also frequency multiplexing in the column. Good. Um, and also, I just wanted to highlight the, finally the idea of um, a, a multi cornisk that uh, our team members at Quantum Motion have put forward, especially um, one of our founders, uh, Professor, Professor Simon Benjamin, that basically thought of the idea of uh, the fact that variational quantum algorithms may require a large number of repetitions of a quantum circuit uh, or variations to solve a problem. So one of the, uh, the ideas uh, that we started thinking about is what will be the resources, for example, if we wanted to calculate uh, the 5 by 5 Fermi Hubbard model uh, or a simulation of it uh, with 25 atoms, which is already a problem that is intractable by, uh, for classical computers, but is of interest in terms of um, the understanding better superconductivity, for example. So it requires 50 qubits to perform uh, that simulation with a total number of 40,000 gates and a required fidelity to arrive to a meaningful solution of uh, 10 to the minus four uh, on the two qubit gates. So if we estimate that uh, silicon uh, gate speeds could be of the order of 10 megahertz for the one qubit gate and one megahertz for the two qubit gates, uh, if we wanted to calculate a single time step of this uh, very complex problem, it would take six days. Uh, and if we wanted to calculate 100 time steps, that would take 1.6 years. So it's, it's not very uh, tractable in terms of uh, time scales. But if we uh, manufacture a thousand processors to calculate these 100 time steps, we could reduce massively the time to solution. And I think silicon here is an excellent example to do that because it's a compact um, uh, system. You know, transistors have the length scales now approaching uh, or, or going below 10 nanometers. Our transistors are not that small, uh, are of the order of 20 to 40 nanometers in gate length, uh, but they are extremely compact. And you can, in principle, imagine putting many of these cores from the same silicon die, like we do now with uh, multi-core approaches for classical computers, and run these uh, cores in parallel to arrive the solution faster. So if you like this idea, please, please check uh, the publication from uh, send you um, on, on this result. Okay, so with this, I would like to conclude and say that uh, quantum mo motion is using industrial silicon technology to build a large scale quantum computer, but we are rethinking the computer from its basic elements all the way up to guarantee scalability. We are a quantum hardware focus company, but our designs are informed by algorithms. So uh, I hope this presentation triggers interest uh, among some of the researchers listening. And I hope uh, you may want to decide to join us in this uh, exciting endeavor. Uh, if you do so, please contact us. Um, and we will be very happy to hear from you. And I would like to thank our fantastic from, uh, collaborators at IMEC, Leti, INAC, Itachi, and our funders. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please go ahead. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for that really uh, um, fascinating talk. And uh, great, uh, great to see the results and, and the progress. Um, absolutely brilliant. So if I could ask Nick to, to join us again. Hello, Nick. And uh, Henry, uh, if you could join us a, as well. And we've already got some questions coming through. So if I could ask Nick, um, could you start to, to perhaps start with the questions in the Q&A? And for anyone in the audience, please add your your questions to those Q&A and we'll try to get to as many as we can in the, the time remaining. Great. Okay, uh, should, I, yeah. should I read them off here or um, do you want to interact with me? Okay, Henry sure. will moderate so Henry can okay. read uh, So the first one I'm going to pick uh, is uh, from Eduardo. Which EU country is well positioned to lead the way in quantum computing research for the next few years? Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, but first, I'd like to thank Fernando for a very interesting presentation. Thanks so much, Fernando. That was great. Um, so the EU, uh, the EU has a 1 billion euro flagship uh, that they're doing, and there's been a lot of more recent um, 
funding that's that's going on in the space of quantum computing uh, in Germany and the UK, um, Switzerland. Um, you see some stuff going on in Helsinki because they make the fridges there. Um, there's activity in Chalmers, Copenhagen, uh, Netherlands. So it's it's hard to say because there's. Um, I, I guess that's kind of the answer. <laughs> Maybe yeah, those no, all those questions, all those countries have stuff. And I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm also neglecting like France and Spain, of course, and Austria. There's, there's, there's activities going on in, in a lot of ones, but uh, there's, there's certainly been some big splashes in terms of funding, and uh, we're kind of seeing what's happening um, going on there. So, uh, I'd just like to say, for one example, I'm, I've become in, um, more involved with the activities in Germany because uh, IBM is putting a fridge there. Uh, in Germany, in fact, that's like kind of on its way over there. I've trained the people in order to do the experiment so that they can, you know, calibrate their quantum computer, for example. Right. And they have a lot of, they're, yeah, they're throwing a lot of money at it, so. Um, let's uh, pick up another question. Um, so you mentioned a thousand qubit system. Uh, Michael Williams asked, once error correction is included, how many computational qubits do you expect to have? <laughs> probably one. <laughs> um, I mean, we we need we definitely need to get the error rates lower so that we have more than one for a thousand qubits. But that's kind of in the ballpark of estimates right now for the current error rates. Um, so I mean, I think we'd hope we at least have two logical qubits there. Which even for two logical qubits, you have a lot of overhead qubits to um, uh, to couple them together. And and I think this this also gets a little bit more stringent because we have less connectivity in the heavy hex lattice. Cool. Uh, the next question is from Peter Morgan and a question for Fernando. Uh, what are the similarities and differences between your work in Silicon with the group in Sydney that John Martinez has just joined? Well, that's a very good question. Um, so the, uh, the work uh, that's going on in, uh, in Australia, uh, led by uh, Professor Michal Simons and now joined by uh, John Martinez, um, focuses in slightly different uh, technology. Um, in um, Australia, they use uh, STM, scanning tunneling microscope pattern at uh, silicon structures, in which uh, atom by atom, they build the quantum processor. Um, the units that they use for computation are not uh, regions of space where you will uh, capture your uh, electrons with electrostatic potentials. These are captured with uh, the electrostatic potential of individual dopants in silicon. So, um, Professor Simon's group, what they do is uh, they place these uh, phosphorus dopants wherever they want with uh, STM uh, technology, and they build up their um, processors uh, one atom at a time, basically. So, uh, this is a very interesting um, a proposition. Uh, it comes from the original idea of Bruce Kane for quantum computing, um, but. Uh, we believe that uh, building your quantum circuits one at a time, although uh, a very interesting proposition, is a less scalable proposition compared to using transistors that uh, with single uh, optical exposures you can make uh, thousands or billions of uh, transistors on the same go um, using uh, standard nanofabrication techniques. Uh, so that's why uh, we bet more strongly on on uh, CMOS technology and quantum dot-based uh, technology made out of uh, transistors. Um, just to sort of follow on, um, Tom Swift asks, how are you planning to solve the problems of the lack of cooling power at low temperatures currently needed in silicon cubic technologies? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is an open question for the field. Um, there are, there's a lot of, lots of people working on this. Um, very soon you will um, and you may have already seen some work that uh, tries to quantify um, the, the dissipated power of uh, uh, fast operating uh, cryogenic ele uh, electronics at low temperatures. I think, first of all, the very good news, as uh, Nick was saying, is that uh, CMOS devices can work at 4 Kelvin and even at millikelvin. No? Uh, that was not a given, and this is very good news uh, in terms of integrating uh, both with silicon devices, but also uh, with superconducting devices. Uh, but it is not yet clear up to what point full integration will be possible at millikelvin temperatures. So there is uh, an open debate whether we can, uh, how much we can introduce at millikelvin, 
which will be ideal, the more the better. But it may be that not all the electronics can go there, and some of it needs to go at uh, higher temperatures, uh, maybe three Kelvin, which is uh, a temperature that has a substantial cooling power and more traditional uh, uh, classical circuits can operate without uh, uh, much difficulty. Uh, the next question, I'm going to combine two of the questions, and this is uh, for everyone on the panel. Um, the first part of this question is, is a PhD necessary to enter a career in quantum computing? And then the sort of second part is, um, what area do you think uh, you need to come from? Is it physics background, engineering background? I mean, maybe tell us a bit about your own personal journeys, how you got into quantum. Uh, go ahead, Fernando. Okay. Uh, well, maybe I'll start with the background. Um, I think uh, quantum computing has become a very inter interdisciplinary field. Um, and we need people uh, from many different backgrounds, uh, physicists, uh, electrical engineers, computer scientists, and mathematicians, uh, nanofabrication experts, so people coming from chemistry as well. So uh, there is a wide variety of uh, routes to get into quantum computing, I would say, nowadays, because we need you all uh, to make this as a, as a, a successful field. Um, in terms of um, the PhD, um, well, personally, uh, I did a PhD on a topic related to quantum computing, and I think um, if uh, I think it's generally uh, a good way to get into quantum computing, computing is to do a PhD on it. No? If you if you really like the topic, it's a very good way uh, to get trained uh, by people like me and then uh, keep on this career that uh, is looking very good at the moment. No? Uh, things are looking very good at the, at the moment in terms of quantum computing, I will, and I will encourage you as much as possible to pursue um, this field if you, if you think you like it. No? So um, I will encourage you not to try a, a PhD route. And I probably have a similar background to Fernando. Uh, I have a PhD in physics, and I joined uh, IBM in 2013. And, at that time, you know, pretty much everyone, other than the engineers we had in the lab, had a PhD in physics, and, and that was kind of the way things were. Um, but I'd also like to say with all the kind of open source uh, software that uh, is being developed, a lot of my coworkers now are coming out of undergrad with, um, say, dual interests in computer science and physics. I have several colleagues that, that have that background who are, you know, actively developing software and techniques for measurement and uh, pulse level control, for example, that did not finish a PhD. And then I'm kind of add, I completely agree with Fernando that like we need people of all kinds of skills. And I would kind of advise anyone who is interested in the field is kind of look at the broad spectrum of skills that are out there and find the one that you are most passionate about and pursue that. But at the same time, kind of broaden your uh, scope and make sure that you're, you're, you're paying attention to all the other uh, adjacent fields that are useful in quantum computing. And, and in that, there's, there's, you're kind of starting to see um, these interdisciplinary quantum science and engineering programs come out, uh, especially at the master's level, and it's moving to the PhD level where they kind of train this broad spectrum of skills. So, you know, Fernando and I probably spent all our time in the clean room in grad school, and, uh, you know, we have these kinds of experiences. Um, and it's good for people to, uh, you know, it's good for people to, to know what they're doing in the clean room, but for example, they won't let me in the clean room here. Uh, <laughs> luckily, I don't really miss it. <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, there's uh, skills in electronics, skills in, in, in chemistry, fabric, uh, uh, physics, of course, um, computer science, these are all uh, very useful. I mean, I have, you know, I, I have colleagues that have PhDs in physics and aren't very good at programming, but pro coding is one of the skills that I think goes really, really far. And like, even if you are passionate about physics, I, I, would, I would also encourage you to be uh, a very good coder and, and to, to hone those skills as well. Uh, that probably allows me to slip in a final question, maybe. I don't know. Peter, should we wrap up? Um, one final question then, Let, let's, uh, then, then we'll wrap it up. Uh, so this is from Nick, so you were talking about coding, which open source aspect of Qiskit would you recommend attempting contributing to? That's a, another great question, and I think, um, so, so first off, I, I think kind of the, the, the bedrock, uh, Terra, where kind of the rubber meets the road is, is kind of the easiest one, because that's, 
kind of where the interface of computer science and physics happens. So that's where you take, I've got this abstract quantum circuit I read about in some paper or, you know, Mike, Mike and Ike's quantum computation, quantum information, and I want to put it on a quantum computer. Well, that needs to be broken down into the native gate set of a particular hardware. And every every uh, different kind of quantum hardware, I mean, uh, superconducting qubits versus uh, silicon spins, they're going to have different native gate sets, essentially the interactions that are uh, that are like kind of fundamental to using those qubits. And they're going to be different. And the way you want to take that abstract circuit down into uh, something that you implement with, say, pulse, pulses and, and DC controls and, and, and the like is going to be different. And so there's this level of like kind of compilation there. Uh, which also has like this level of like the actual physics that's going on top of that. So that's kind of like uh, a good case for uh, computer scientists and physicists. But then again, it, it depends on your background. So if you're really into like, if, if you say you have a nuclear magnetic resonance background, then maybe uh, Ignis might be the one for you because uh, that has a lot of error calibration routines that are based off, you know, pulse sequences from that field. Uh, if you have a if you have a background in open quantum systems, then then air might be where you want to do because that's all about where where noise models are. And in fact, my friend who has a background in open quantum systems runs that. Uh, but if you have um, if you're really into VQE and or QAOA and, and current NISC era algorithms, then then Aqua is where you want to do uh, you where you want to program, you know, your ability to to use the quantum computer for something and run run algorithms, uh, that's that's probably where you want to contribute. So it, it kind of depends on your your background and focus. Right. Thanks. I, and I think it's clear that you know it's never been more accessible. Um, uh, there, there certainly was a time that if you wanted to do uh, something related to quantum, you would need that quantum PhD, that physics PhD. But I think now, uh, thanks to the fantastic work um, to to make as much open source and to 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 reduce those barriers it's really something that that we um uh we see uh, uh opening up more and more to to more and more people which is fantastic if this industry is going to to scale so thank you very much nick thank you very much fernando uh, really really interesting talk tonight we really appreciate your time today and thank you for everyone for attending uh, we'll have more talks coming up so stay tuned and um uh, henry will be sending out some emails uh, soon regarding those details so Thank you, Henry, for your work with uh, the organization as well. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.